is look at John's Gospel, chapter 11. And by the way, a little commercial, uh, next week we're going to start a little brief series on the anointing. The anointing, what's that all about? God talked to me about that last night in the middle of the night, and I felt like, you know, we really need to have a look at that, especially in these days in which we live. So beginning next Wednesday, we'll be doing a little series, short series on what the Bible says about the anointing. But tonight, uh, you probably saw in the bulletin, our teaching is on the subject, you shall live and not die. If you have your Bible with you, I'm looking at John's Gospel, chapter 11. We pick up the reading in verse 23, John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 23. This is the back and forth between Jesus and Martha, the sister of Lazarus. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She says unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one which should come into the world. As I was praying for our friend Jeff Stepp, we always shorten his name, that's kind of what he does, um, about his current health challenges. Um, this was months ago, as soon as I found out, I had this phrase come to me. It was almost like watching a little mini vision, and I was pointing at him, and I said, you shall live and not die. Three times I said it, you shall live and not die. And then every once in a while, in the middle of the night particularly, he would come to my mind and I would pray for him. And once again, while I was praying, I would find myself pointing at him in the spirit, if you will, saying the same thing. And I thought, well, that's good news for anybody that's got any kind of health challenge. Uh, and I found out that that phrase is actually used in a slightly different way also by Jesus in John 11. And when I looked at, at the whole portion of scripture there, there's a beautiful message for anyone, someone that's that's well, someone that's not doing well, someone who's young, old, in between, uh, anyone who is a believer. And if a person is not a believer, it's a wake-up call that they should strongly consider it uh, and do it right away. There's a promise here for the future, for all of us. There's also a promise for the present, and that's what we want to look at. First of all, we'll look at the promise for the future, and I think we all know the backstory of the situation um, I mentioned in this little book, by the way, this story of Lazarus uh, really illustrates and illuminates our spiritual path when, quote, unquote, bad things happen to good people. When something happens and we wonder why, why did God allow it? Why didn't God prevent it? Why didn't God warn? Why was, you know, Satan involved? Whatever. We wonder what's what. Uh, this is a really good story that answers a lot of that kind of concern. We mentioned this before, if you weren't here, the word Lazarus translates the Hebrew word name Eleazar, which means helped by God. Isn't that kind of interesting that um, this man literally lived out what his name was? Um, as I mentioned again in my book, and I think maybe in a message, Lazarus is interesting because he's one of only four people in the New Testament that the Bible specifically says Jesus loved. Lazarus, his sisters, Mary and Martha, and also John, the apostle, are four people that, of course, he loves everyone, but he especially loved them. And as again, I mentioned in the book, teaching point here, wake up call, Jesus deliberately waited too long to help Lazarus, the one he loved. He waited deliberately too long to help, and Lazarus had passed away. As a matter of fact, he had passed away four days before Jesus ever actually got there. So he had been dead for, for some time. We'll talk again in just a minute about when this first started. But even though he was delayed too long to help, Martha, if you read the backstory, affirmed her belief that in other words, 
in your mind, uh, Lord, it's never too late. And can I throw this in another commercial? That's the subject of Sunday's message. It's never too late where there's life, there's hope. And I hope God gets us lit up like a Christmas tree Sunday because I was really jazzed preparing that message. It's never too late. And it's absolutely God's truth. So here it is. The promise for the future that we all have, anyone who will embrace Jesus. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Now, he's in the tomb already four days. The word we've looked at in another connection is just that. It's stasis, which means to stand with a nut on the front. So it literally means to stand again, to rise again. In the days of the New Testament, it came to be associated with resurrection of the body. Now, think about this. She had her beliefs together when this happened. There's only one thing better than coming through trouble successfully. It's being prepared in advance where it doesn't even, it doesn't even shake you at all. You're, you're ready, willing, and able to meet the conflict, whatever it is, because of your belief system. That was Martha. She says to him, I remain certain that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Where did Martha get that information, I wonder? If you study the Old Testament, you find the afterlife is kind of fuzzy. And even in the time of Jesus, the the Sadducees, one group of the Bible teachers, didn't believe in a resurrection at all. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in angels or miracles or anything like that. And then those who did believe in those things were a little bit fuzzy on exactly what happens after you die. Today, as far as I know, practicing Jewish folk are in that same realm. They're not really sure completely of exactly what happens to a loved one after they live this this life. So how did she get this information? Daniel's prophecy. You can look at it sometime. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 very clearly prophesies regarding God's people in the last day. Daniel says, these shall arise to everlasting life, those unto judgment. So Martha was a Bible reader and she had spiritual concrete under her feet, which is what you and I need, especially in days like this. And she got it from the Bible. Now, when she talked about, I believe he'll be resurrected in the last day, she's talking about this first resurrection unto life. And as we looked at Sunday, for believers, it's good news. The the, the return of Jesus, the first resurrection, great news. Not only do we get a new body, but we also get our reward for stewardship over our time and tithes and talent. Um, let me just give you the scripture that I mentioned Sunday. I, I think it's, it's, kind of, it's, almost, it's kind of awesome. It's so simple, but it's so clear and so helpful. Maybe it means more to me because <laughs> I've been on the other side and came back. Every day is a good day, you know, if I'm on the right side of the grass. But here it is. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. You can write this down if you haven't read it for a while. This is Paul. Therefore, judge not anything. Before the season, Daniel's last days, Martha's last day. Don't judge anything before the season until the Lord may have come, who will bring to light the hidden things of the darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. If you stop there, it's, oh, I don't want want the counsel of the heart to come out. I don't want what's in darkness to be exposed. But it's not bad news at all. It's good news. And then shall each receive the praise from God. So what are these things that are hidden in the darkness? What are these hidden counsels of the hearts? They're stuff that you and I didn't blow a trumpet about. Remember when Jesus said, if you give your alms, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Everything you and I have done for the kingdom of God that we didn't blow a trumpet about, it's going to all come out. And can you imagine some of the saints, they're going to swallow their false teeth. Oh, they won't have any then. 
and they'll be looking around. Wow, I didn't know she did that. Can you believe him? Can you believe them? What they did, we never heard about it. They never asked for thanks or you have their name in the bulletin or whatever. But that's what this is about. And this last season is the, the season of, of judgment or reward for believers. Do you like little bonuses? I like those. Here's, here's one right here. Don't judge anything until the Lord may have come. Who's that? Jesus, right? The second coming of Christ. And then shall every man receive the praise from God. I thought we were talking about the Lord, Jesus. Now Paul says they're going to get the reward from God. Oops. Oh, wow. One little sentence, two little words, another affirmation that Jesus is God in the flesh. Isn't that beautiful? So the next age after this age will be the millennium when you and I and every saved person will rule and reign with Christ on planet earth for a thousand years before the next resurrection, the resurrection of the unbelievers to their final judgment. So that's a promise for the future. And maybe it means more to me than some other folk because I am farther along now than I used to be. And we never know what's going to happen. That wonderful fellow that does the maintenance work for the rack company was around today to fix uh, two toilet things. And he told me just recently he, he had a fall. And it must have been really something. And he said when he hit, I think he hit some scaffolding when he, when he fell. He said he heard a crunch down in his back. <laughs> and he said he got up and He's moving. He said, oh, wow, that feels good. He said it was just like going to the chiropractor. But it could have been something else, right? I tumbled down 14 stairs, as you know, blank over teacups. And I could have busted my skull. I could have broken all, all my bones, etc. But thank God it didn't happen. So it's nice to know that we are headed as believers, like Lazarus, like Martha, Mary, we are headed for a time when everything we've ever done for the kingdom of God, every temptation we've resisted, every plan and purpose and pursuit of God for our lives, we said yes to, and it's going to be a beautiful time. Well, pastor, that sounds pretty good for the sweet by and by. Can you give me something for the nasty now? Well, I can't, but the Lord can. Here's the promise for the present. Look at it with me. John's Gospel 11 Verse 23 and following. I love this portion. This is where Jesus lays the spiritual cards on the table. And like he always does, he pulls no punches. He clearly de declares his identity and his ability to do what only God can do. I've been reading here and there, and it's amazing to me how some of these philosophers and founders of religion are so highly esteemed for what they said or what they taught or where they went or some good deed that they did, how pale they are in comparison to the Savior. There is no comparison between Jesus and any other founder of any other religion. And there's a good reason for that, and here it is. Martha says, Lord, I, I, I've come to this settled conclusion. I went to Sunday school. I've got it. Daniel 12, 2 tells me my brother's going to rise at the last day at the resurrection of the righteous. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says to her, I, I am the resurrection and the life. If you read this gospel carefully, you will find that Jesus uses this phrase a number of times. And when he does, especially among the, the Bible preaching elite of his day, he really, he really gets it. Uh, they normally pick up stones to throw at him. Why? I've mentioned this before. In the time of our Savior, the people of God did not have a Bible in their own language. They had a Bible in Hebrew, but not one Jewish person in a hundred could read Hebrew. Their given language was Aramaic for a number of centuries and also 
their new other language, Greek. Now, they had no Aramaic Old Testament. There was, there was no Aramaic Old Testament. So even their Hebrew vernacular, Aramaic, was of no use in terms of reading the Bible. But those who were bilingual, and by the time of Christ, nearly every Jew was bilingual, they had this Greek Old Testament. And when you come to Exodus 3.14, we've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. It's beautiful. When the Jewish translators brought this into Greek, when Moses says to Yahweh, who should I say sent me? And Yahweh says, I am sent you. When they brought that into Greek, the translators used this phrase, ego, imi, o, on. I, I am the living one. So when Jesus says this, he didn't just say, I'm the resurrection. He could have done. He said, ego, imi, I, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, he was calling himself God. That's why he can talk about raising someone from the dead because he has the ability to do that. He's God. And as I say, it usually brought persecution. Now watch this. The one continually believing on me, though he die, he shall live. In other words, your brother, even though he's died, he's going to live, right? Every believer is going to be resurrected except one, one group, and that, that's those who are alive when Jesus returns, and we'll just have an instantaneous transformation quicker than you can blink your eye for our new body. So the language is very important here. Do you notice it says, the one continually believing in me, though he die, yet shall he live? I think it's kind of important. Anybody here know someone that went to the altar, prayed the sinner's prayer? Maybe you saw them uh, getting signed up at your church. They were publicly welcomed into the fellowship, maybe had their pictures taken. The first church I attended since I was born again, that's what they used to do. It's nothing good or bad about it. We've got to welcome our new members this month. And they'd bring 10 or 12 people over, and they would take snaps of them, you know. And here they are, and make sure you chat them up after service, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you and I all know people that that's the extent of their Christianity. In other words, they were just joined again. They weren't born again. And they're not really believers. Well, how do we know that? Because they don't continue. So this is, this is basically saying, Jesus is saying, the person that really believes in me is going to continue believing in me because something's going to happen down here. I'm going to change his inner man so that he is literally no longer the same. He is a new creation. Something, someone who has never existed before. And when he says, though he die, he shall live, what's he talking about? The body, his physical self, even though that, because he's talking about resurrection. Even though he die, he physically will be resurrected, resurrected, he'll live. Now here's the promise for the present. I'm glad he didn't stop there, how about you? I'm glad he kept going, because I'm, I'm not dead yet, are you? I hope not. Um, now comes the wonderful information for the present. And everyone. This is fantastic, isn't it? When you really stop. Who's speaking here? God. God in human form. These are the words of God. And everyone, the one living and believing on me, shall absolutely not die forever. That's a stupendous promise because that's good news, not just for the sweet by and by, but for the nasty now. And I would suggest it has two applications. One, to me, it opens the door for a resuscitation in this life, such as, Lazarus had. Um, <clears throat> yours tr truly had. My old man had it. He was only gone for about maybe three to five minutes, but he got resuscitated and lived another three days. That's another story for another day. But this is good news. It opens the door for a resurrection in this life. As a matter of fact, when my dad <clears throat> had kicked off, I was praying very intently. He was in real bad shape even after he had passed away. We thought he might pass away again. 
and I was outside his room with my mom, and I don't forget who else was there. And I'm just praying in the Holy Spirit kind of undertone. I didn't want them to put me in the other ward, you know, <laughs> people with the white coats. Um, so I was just praying undertone. And the Holy Ghost quickened Psalm 118, verse 17 to me. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of Yah. That's what the psalmist said. And I, thought, I told my mom, I said, he's, he's coming through this. How do you know? I said, God just told me in the Psalms, he'll live and not die. The psalmist has it backwards. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of Yah. God can do it. He does do that. But look at it with me. At first glance, it seems a little confusing, right? Because only one generation of believers will literally not die. Only one generation, right? Those who are alive at the return of the Lord. They're the ones that will not die physically. So what is he on about here? Everyone, not just the last generation, everyone, the one living and believing on me, shall absolutely not die forever. And again, if, if you were there listening to this, as some Jewish folk were, and you heard Jesus talking, and he said, absolutely not, ooh, me, it's a double negative. So it's one of the strongest things a Greek speaker can, can say. In other words, it's absolutely uh, not going to happen. He'll never die, ever, forever. And so you think, well, what's that about? What do you mean you won't die? Here's what he means. There's no death for saints. There's no physical death for saints. So in my prayer time, as I was saying, you shall live and not die, I'm thinking physically you won't die from this cha physical challenge. And God can and does do that. God gave, me, God gave me kind of another version of that. The sickness, this one, is not unto death, but rather for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. And that's actually from the same story about Lazarus, right? So that's absolutely true. God absolutely can and does do that. But this is something else. This is something else. He's meaning there's no, in a sense, there's no death for saints either. Well, what is it? They simply fall asleep. When my dad was living, he had a dream one night that his dad had appeared to him in a dream. And of course, he was shocked. You know, what's my, my dad doing here? And his old man told him, never be afraid of death. Death is just falling asleep. And I've shared, I think, Sunday. I'm starting to get a couple of little flashes of memory after this deal in, in February now. And one of the most recent ones was when it actually happened, I did have a flash of a memory of being in front of our kitchen window. And it was just like someone turned the lights off. Like if you have a dimmer switch. And there was no pain, you know, there was no pain, there was no discomfort. It was just like, Doop. goodbye. And that was it. That's Bible. We have scripture for that. I mean, you, you know, other people and myself have experience of it, but this is scripture. There's no death for saints. Well, is that exactly right, Pastor? Look earlier with me. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus tells the disciples, our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going to go and, and wake him up. Do you remember what they said to him? Well, Lord, if he's sleeping, that's good. You know, I mean, sleep is a great restorer. How many remember Elijah? He was between the rock and a, half, and, and a uh, hard place and about half backslid. And, and uh, the, the angel of the Lord put him to sleep twice and fed him some angel cake, you know. So the sleep restored Elijah, brought him out of a death-dealing depression. Sleep's good. And the disciples said, hey, Lord, if, if he's just falling asleep... It's all good because when he wakes up, he'll be over whatever it is that got him. Um, our friend Lazarus, Jesus says, has permanently fallen asleep. But in contrast, I go in order that I may awake him. And 
they chat him up. Well, you know, you don't have to if he's sleeping. <laughs> then the Bible says, Jesus says to them, Lazarus died. <laughs> Boom. Lazarus died. What did he describe Lazarus' death as, though? Isn't that something? Sleep. He's fallen asleep. I'll wake him up. That's, that's one witness. Acts chapter 7, verse 60. When Stephen seals his testimony with his own blood as they're pelting him with rocks, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, just like Jesus on the cross. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Having said this, the Bible says he what? Fell asleep. Two witnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, Paul refers to departed, deceased believers as those who have fallen asleep. Three witnesses. Bonus round. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, Paul again says that those who sleep do not lag behind those of us who are alive when Jesus returns for that first resurrection unto life and reward. So four times, and there are many more, in the New Testament alone, we have the death of a believer referred to not as death, but only as sleep. So Jesus was not mincing words or confusing things when he said, everyone, not just Lazarus, everyone, the one living and believing on me, shall absolutely not die forever. Not just the end time people who live to see the coming of the Lord, but anyone and everyone who's been a believer will never actually die. Like my grandfather told my dad, and like my own experience, we just fall asleep. How awesome is that? With the drivers we have today, <laughs> with the pandemic we apparently have, even with you know, such a minuscule death rate still, with this contagious deal, with all the other challenges we have, I believe this is extremely good news for our hearts and for friends of ours, for family members, for people that are going through a tough time, for people who are unsure about their faith, maybe because they haven't been in the right church or read the, the right scripture or have been taught the right thing. I think this can be a real game changer. And, and this life doesn't have to be so much uh, walking over a, a flame, holding a, you know, a, ro a rope with gre that's greased, you know. It doesn't have to be that way. We can go on our way rejoicing. So we shall not live. We shall live, I should say, and not die. And I think that's good news. It can be literal, healing from a sickness, and it's certainly spiritual for every believer. Anybody have any questions or problems? Mike? Say, um, people, does it mean people in general or just Christians that fall asleep? Does it mean like... Everybody at no. The, at the moment. Right. No. The question: Does this falling asleep? Everyone. No. No one really dies. No. Jesus said, "The one that's believing on me." So yeah, this is a big difference, because for the believer, the sting of death is gone, which is why it's literally called falling asleep. You can trace that out, and uh, I found that fascinating at the very beginning of this story. Our friend Lazarus. He actually, it's perfect. He, he fell asleep and he remains asleep. You'd think they would wonder, why is he still asleep? You know, what's going on here? Somebody give him CPR, but they, did, they didn't, the penny didn't drop. But I think that's fascinating. And I'll go wake him up. So that's in this life. But that's really what resurrection is. It's a wake up for our body at that point. It's a very good question. No, it's not sleep for everybody. Um, because people who are not believers are still under the curse of the law. Uh, and thank God we're not. So it's definitely a blessing. Right, as a matter of fact, along that line, I mentioned this Sunday. In the resurrection, I think a lot of us don't think about this. We're resurrected with new bodies. But when the unbelievers are resurrected, they're resurrected in their old body. Can you imagine living in this for eternity? Same problems you had, and it just never, you know, it never changes. So it's, you know, it's quite something. I want to give it a miss. I don't know about anybody else. I'm not going there. Not doing that. Anybody else? 
Praise the Lord. We had some wonderful gifts this week. Uh, Sunday morning's offering was not even, gosh, what, wasn't even a fourth uh, of our budget. And I thought, oh, well. And I think it was Tuesday. Tuesday, we're over half of our budget, just like that. Three different gifts changed day and night. And I'm sure it'll be, again, better by the end of the week. So God is doing wonderful, wonderful things. But if this is your night to give, baskets are always here. And we will come around the Lord's table.